Hey, do you hug your haters? Why not? They are the best source of improvement, says today's guest, marketing doyon Jay Bear. Let's find out why. Well, I said, welcome to a small business marketing show where successful small business owners share their souls to take your marketing straight to the lead. Now, here's your host, Mr. Tim Bowie. And welcome back, listeners, to another episode of Australia's number one marketing show. I am your host, Timbo Reed. You, though, yeah, so much more importantly, you're a motivated business owner and you are ready to crank out some great marketing in order to build that beautiful business of yours into the empire it deserves to be. Hey, big show. Marketing legend, Jay Bear. He's the author of a wonderful book that had a huge influence on my marketing called Utility. He now joins us to talk about his new book titled Hug Your Haters. Great title. It's all about how to embrace complaints and keep your customers. Got a great win from a forum member that you'll find very, very inspiring. Got an interesting request from a listener who's got a really good idea for an upcoming episode and a motivational quote that'll have you looking desperately, and I mean desperately, at your watch, yeah? Hey, uh, today's show lovingly brought to you by Net Registry, who do care about one thing and one thing only, and that, my wonderful fellow business owners, is getting your online marketing sorted. That's about getting the right domain name, the right web hosting, web design, getting that website found, everything. Check out their exclusive listener packages over at netregistry.com.au forward slash, what is it? Timbo. You got it. Hey, we're also made possible by a key person of influence, a wacky name, but an amazing program. And if you are keen to become visible, valued, and connected in your industry, I'd suggest you take a look at keypersonofinfluence.com forward slash Timbo. They've got some really good live events coming up, and you can reserve your seat over there. As per usual, marketing gold. Yep, G-O-L-D, dripping from the ceiling over here at Small Business Big Marketing's HQ. So let's get stuck right in. Do you need a speaker for your next conference? Recommend Timbo to your event organiser. Or better still, book him. Tim Reed. That's R-E-I-D dot com dot A-U. Now, got a great small win I want to share with you from a fellow member of the Small Business Big Marketing Forum. And by the way, if you're not a member yet, head over to crankmymarketing.com and join up for 30 days. See how it goes. This is from Ellen. And it is great stuff. He says, hey, guys, this is a post he put in the forum, by the way, where we share small wins. We have a strong belief in the small business, big marketing community that you've got to share your wins, no matter what their size. Because as small business owners, we sort of kind of can live in a bit of a silo, yeah? And we need to get out there and celebrate amongst our mates, colleagues. You know what I mean? Ellen says, hey guys, just thought I'd share some positivity. Well, that is a good thing. Got to be more of that in the world. I started a laser tattoo removal business in October last year. Tried various marketing from leaflet drops, Twitter ads, Google ads, all sorts of referral schemes. Things were picking up, but then I took a video of a treatment happening. Now, I need around 20 treatments a month to cover loans, rental, etc. These are my appointment figures after a Facebook video ad. The ad was average, spelling mistakes, shaky video on my phone, but these are my figures for appointments. Now, you ready for this, team? He's just done a very average amateur on his iPhone video of a treatment that he did on a patient. Here's his appointment figures. October, he had seven appointments. November, 18. December, 22. Well, steady growth, bit by bit. January, hey, 112. February, 159. And he goes on to say, I am already fully booked until April. 
Hey, thank you, Timbo, for the advice and motivation with the project and also for the older podcasts. It was only after listening to the back edition and that chiropractor episode that gave me the inspiration to shoot a video. Now, what he's referring to, uh, and by the way, my pleasure, Alan. Thank you for being a forum member and a motivated business owner. Love your work. He's referring to a video, uh, an interview I did with a chiropractor who does film a lot of the adjustments that he does and the results that he get. He gets. It works. That's helpful marketing at work. Showing people what you do. It's particularly, this applies to service or product marketers, by the way, um, because it builds trust and familiarity. So celebrate the small wins, team. And if you want someone to do it with, do it with me over in the forum at crankmymarketing.com. Righto, team, let's get stuck into today's guest because I'm pretty chuffed about having this bloke on the show. His name is Jay Bear. Oh, it is spelt B-A-E-R. Trips me every now and then. He's a New York Times bestselling author of a wonderful book called Utility, which has been a big influence on my marketing progression and, in fact, um, is also the kind of the inspiration for my helpful marketing concept that forms the basis of my upcoming book, uh, which is called The Boomerang Effect, where if you create helpful marketing, it will return multiples. Jay's got this new book. Oh, actually, can I tell you one thing? He's written the testimonial for my new book, The Boomerang Effect. I'm pretty excited by that. Can I read it to you? It's going to appear on the front cover. It says, I'm going to read it anyway. I know a couple of you said, no, no, get on with the interview, but I want to share it with you. Jay, in, my, in his testimonial to me, says, ironically, the less you try to sell, the more you actually sell. Timbo provides an outstanding playbook here for any business person that wants to use the power of helpfulness to outflank their competition. Oh, hello. Jay Bear. New York Times bestselling author. Love it. Hey, now Jay has written this his new book, Hug Your Haters. It's a book that's all about embracing complaints and keeping your customers. Great title, great book. Now, uh, tune into this because we discuss how, where and why people complain. So sort of the psychology of complaints, if you like. How and when consumers expect a response when they do complain the impact of answering or ignoring a customer complaint and the different types of complaints. We cover a lot of ground, team, and it is wonderful. There's a couple of surprise learnings in here around the whole complaint thing that will help drive your business forward. I started off by asking Jay, what's he love about marketing? Well, I just love the fact that when you do it right, when you do marketing right, Timbo, you're, you're taking something that somebody wants or perhaps needs and you're putting it in front of them. The best kind of marketing, I think, are those circumstances where, where you really allow people to, to discover something great, something they didn't know, mm-hmm. something they weren't even sure that they wanted. Uh, it's almost magic, right? When you do marketing yeah. well, it almost has that layer of magic to it. Uh, and I really, really like that. I will also tell you, that I'm a big fan of modern marketing, uh, especially online, because it is so measurable. Uh, my original background a long time ago, you may not know this, was in politics. And I loved politics. I was a campaign consultant. And I loved politics because in politics, you either win or you lose. Like There's a very defined scoreboard. And what I like about online marketing is that it's much easier to keep score. Like You know how many people clicked and looked and bought, etc., uh, offline, you know, with with sort of older marketing, print and radio and uh, and and newspaper and such, it's sometimes a little bit harder. But but I really like the math side of it myself. It's really interesting you use the word magic or magical because one of the things that I talk about is I think there's a lot of business owners, particularly the smaller business owners, that find marketing a dark art. Why do you think that is? Well, because there are lots of parts to it. Um, it what, I, what I like to tell people, Timbo, is that is that it's not hard, but it is complicated. Hmm. And there's a difference between hard and complicated, right? Complicated just means you can figure it out if you take the time to learn how to do it. Hard means there actually is some level of facility necessary. So um, it, it's not as if, it, you know, if you are a plumber, for example, 
you can learn the different things that that might uh, come across your desk in the plumbing business. Like you, there's there's this many types of things that you will probably do. You can learn how to do all those things. That's not easy, mm-hmm. but but it is learnable. The thing about marketing, especially modern marketing, that makes it feel like a dark art is that every three months it's different. Mm, yeah. I mean, if you you know. If we talked, if we talked six months ago, I'd tell you to do different things. Six months before then, different things. Six months before then, different things. I mean, marketing has quite literally changed more in the last three years than it did in thirty years before that. And that, if you're not doing it for a living, can be very confusing. Can I just challenge that for a little bit and say that the change, the landscape changes daily. So there's huge cause for anxiety amongst business owners when it comes to marketing. But the fundamentals are the same. Like get your message right first before you worry about where to put it, for example. Oh, of course. Of course. No, I completely agree with that. Mm. What what changes are the tools and the tactics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, what's today, Periscope or... Yeah, that, that stuff changes and <laughs> confuses people. But yeah. but ultimately, it's like you have customers, they have needs, you fill those needs, uh, you take care of people with marketing and then ultimately with customer service. Uh, that, you know, th- those things are all consistent. What changes is the vehicles that you use to, to make it work. So true. So true. Poor old business owners. They've got so much to contend with. Haven't haven't we? <laughs> not they. I was going to say they. Oh, but I, haven't I mean, we? seriously, I can't imagine. And, and I'm not just saying this. I cannot imagine trying to do marketing if you were not a marketing professional. Mm. Like mm. I realize how easy I have it where I can just think about these things all day. And I have an amazing team that's also thinking about these things every day. And, and then we, we work with customers all over the world who don't have that kind of time or room in their head. And I don't know how they do it. I think it, we share a very similar why, Jay, which is, and you just articulated it, you know, the idea of being able to shine. I like to think I shine a very bright light on this very dark art, and I think you do that as well. And I want to thank you for doing that. The first time I came across you was with that wonderful book, Utility, and I just want to personally, right now, no one else listening, thank you for that book. Oh, you're quite welcome. That's very, very kind of you to say. Uh, it is a book that that exceeded my expectations in terms of its impact on how people think about marketing. It's uh, it's been fantastic. Tell me about the. Oh, we're here to talk about hug your haters, and 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 trust me, mate, we'll get there. But with utility, when you wrote that, and I know um, Joe um, Joe from the Content Marketing Institute, he he quoted it as saying uh, it was a, it's a seminal book for marketing. Um, the big words from a big guy. When you're writing a book like that, I always wonder, you know, like when, when Jagger and Richards were writing Satisfaction, you know, did they know? <laughs> you know did you know? Well, that's you the writing... first time I've been in the same sentence with Jagger and Richards, so I appreciate that. <laughs> um, that's very kind. Well, uh, uh, look, it's yeah. the thing. Here's, here's the truth, right? So that was my second book. Yes. Um, the first book I wrote, The Now Revolution, is a very good book. And in fact, it's probably more relevant today than when I wrote it. Um, in fact, I can tell you for sure it's more relevant today than when I wrote it. But the problem with that book and the problem with most business books is that it's about several things. or There, there, there are several concepts, several pieces of advice in the book, and it's really hard to sort it all out. What I did well with Utility and also with, I think, Hug Your Haters is here's one idea. And let's explain this idea to you in multiple different ways with multiple different examples mm-hmm. from multiple people around, around the world big businesses, small businesses, everything in between, so that it doesn't matter who you are, you're like, oh, this book was written for me. And 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 I learned that between book one and book two, and that makes it really resonate with a lot of people. Uh, look, I'll be the first person to tell you that I'm not really in the idea business. Uh, most of the things that I talk about, that I write about, that I speak about are not my ideas per se. What I am really good at, disproportionately good at, is taking ideas that are just starting to emerge and then translating those ideas for the largest possible audience. So what I tell people is I'm not in the invention business, I'm in the translation business. And I think Utility was the right book at the right time, Mm -hmm. uh, fortunately. And some of that was luck and some of it was planned. But when you write a book like that, you don't think, well, this is going to be the book that changes the way people think about marketing. Uh, But but you just hope that it becomes something other than I sold some books. And, And I'm extraordinarily fortunate to go all around the world and people say, oh, we use that as how we you know, this is how we think about our marketing plan is, is it a utility? And just to, to, to see it actually have an impact on people's day-to-day business is, is really incredibly gratifying. I think what you did uh, too was that at the point when, that book, when the book utility came out, all us marketers and those business owners that were interested in marketing were just being bombarded by content marketing. And I make the quote marks there, you yeah. know, content marketing is a big thing. It's, you know, Content Marketing Institute, hey, there it was born, but... 
I would always say there's, there's no shortage of content, right? Um, I you you narrowed it down into useful content. This concept, and and you know, it's about you, the customer. Uh, I've coined the phrase helpful marketing, which is you know my right. it's my phrase about um, about marketing the content marketing that actually goes a step further. It's actually helpful, you know. And um, yeah, I so, completely agree. I mean, the challenge is, and, and, and one of the reasons I I wrote the book, uh, and I don't know if you know this story. So you talked about Joe Palizzi and the Content Marketing Institute. Institute. They have a conference uh, in the States. They've also had some in Australia uh, mm. uh, called Content Marketing World. And the first time I ever talked about utility, and in fact, the reason I came up with the idea is he said, hey, this is like four years ago or whatever. He's like, hey, we're going to do uh, Content Marketing World. I think it was the second year in uh, Cleveland uh, in the US. And can you do like a TED Talk, like a quick you know, 12-minute kind of something about something? I'm like, sure. So I was like, I got to come up with something to talk about in this uh, session. And and I started, you know, under kind of realizing, looking back, that we were working with a lot of our corporate clients on this kind of useful marketing. I said, I think maybe there's a thesis there on this, hmm. on this useful marketing. And so uh, I kind of put together a few minutes uh, on it, and I was in the shower um, about a month before the event, and the name utility just kind of popped into my head. And so that became the first time I ever talked about it was at Content Marketing World, uh, and the reaction was so strong. I'm like, well, maybe there's a book in this. And oh, then I wrote wow. a book, and you know, and here we are. Many wouldn't act on that, hey? Many just kind of go, yeah. oh, that, yeah, that went down That's okay. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. Great Absolutely. book. I will put a link in the show notes, listeners, to the book utility Thanks. if you haven't read it. And I've mentioned a number of times on this show. So I've actually just finished oh, my of- book, um, Jay. It, it is called, it's called The Boomerang Effect, and it is about the idea of creating helpful marketing because when you are helpful, good things come back to you. It comes back in spades, it. so um, look out for that one. I don't think it'll kind of have a you know hold a candle next to utility, but you've got to give it a crack, you know. Us little boys down here in Australia, just giving it a run. Hey, now let's talk about hug your haters because <clears throat> I think this is another example, probably, of you kind of future gazing into this because the internet's here to stay. You'd have to agree with that, wouldn't you? <laughs> Uh, I, I hope so. I've been doing this since 1993. So if it's not <laughs> yeah, here to yeah. stay, it's not going to figure anywhere. something else out. Yeah. So Hug Your Haters is your new book. When I first saw the title, I thought, mm, is that sort of like Pulp Fiction meets Mills and Boone? Um, but it's like, um, <laughs> exactly. What, what made you choose this as the next topic? Explain what Hug Your Haters is and why, why this topic. Well, so right now we're starting to use the same technologies for marketing that we're also using for, for customer service. And, and customer service really hasn't changed at all since the invention of email. Um, but what we're finding, and I did a tremendous amount of first-person research for this book, hired a research firm, surveyed thousands of people to figure out kind of the science of complaint and who's complaining and where and why and how. And what we found is that there's this incredible incredible shift from what we call off-stage customer complaints and customer contacts, mostly telephone and email, to on-stage. So social media, discussion boards, review websites, things like that. And and, and businesses, large and small, are really unprepared for that. Uh, Timbo, right now, one-third of all customer complaints are ignored. One wow. third. And almost all of the customer complaints that are ignored are online because businesses treat customers differently online versus offline. In, uh, in, and in that's what a way? huge, huge in what way? Well, uh, you would never you would never not answer the phone. You would never not reply to an email <laughs> from a customer. But but you will knowingly, willingly ignore a tweet, a Facebook post, a Yelp review, things of that nature, a mention on a discussion board or forum, you just completely blow it off. Um, so, so and and that happens psych- all the time. Uh, just, what's the psychology? You've interviewed a few psychologists for this book. What is the psychology mm-hmm. of ignoring something like um, a review on Yelp uh, or Facebook that isn't going to go away? Like that isn't, the, the phone stops ringing. Um, that, wh- why do we ignore that? I think it's because people have come to believe that interacting with customers online uh, is somehow dangerous or <laughs> that sometimes customers online are 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 trying to extort you yeah, yeah. or are lying or what have you. Yeah. You know, Jay, it does my head in the amount of small business owners that I come across that don't embark on a an, an online marketing journey full stop because of the haters. Oh, <laughs> if, I, if, if I put my head above the waters, the online waters, they're all going to come out. As if they're not. And if they do, how good's that? Yeah, 
No, no, no question. And, and that's really the best advice I can, I can offer is that the hug your haters philosophy, and I go into great detail about this in the book, is to answer every customer in every channel every time. That's it. Just answer every customer in every channel every time. Treat people online the same way you treat them offline. Now, does that require time? It does. Does that require resources? It does. Does that require a commitment? It does. All of those things. But there was a time, like I am deceptively youthful looking. I, you know, when I started in business, <laughs> thank you, sir. When I started in business, I had a typewriter. Like I didn't have, there's no email. Uh, and, and so we had to make time. In every business, in every corner of the world, we had to make time to deal with email. And I remember, because I was there, what people said when email was invented is, we don't have time to communicate with customers via email. And we found a way. And all I'm saying is we got to find a way now to also communicate with customers on Facebook and Twitter and Yelp and all these different places that you probably don't want to do. But guess what? Your customers do want you to interact with them there. We've got to stop engaging with customers only in the places that we prefer and start engaging with customers in the places that they prefer. Hey, listeners, I'm chatting with New York Times bestselling author Jay Bayer. Uh, Before I dig deeper on what he just said there, here's a word from a couple of businesses that want to help grow that beautiful business of yours into the empire it deserves to be. This show is made possible by Key Person of Influence, which according to the Huffington Post is the world's leading brand accelerator program. Now, they've got some very cool one-day events coming up with some amazing speakers. So I asked head honcho Glenn Carlson to pick his favourite. His answer may well surprise you. That's horrible, mate. Um, I'm going to have to say, while there's Matthew who's built, you know, the third fastest growing company in Australia sold it for tens of millions. Valerie is obviously one of the best content creators in Australia, talking about profile. Tim, you know, his company's built over a billion dollars worth of value in his clients. Andrew Griffith's 12 best-selling books. But, mate, I'm the MC. I'm the one that brings it all together. So, you know, despite all these amazing speakers that have got incredible tenure in their space, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say my favourite's got to be me. Oh, you got to love a big cheese that backs himself. All jokes aside, do your business a favour and grab a $57 seat over at keypersonofinfluence.com forward slash Timbo. Support for this show comes from NetRegistry, a one-stop shop for getting your online marketing sorted. Verity Ma, their chief marketing officer, recently told me this story of a very happy mechanic. So one of my favourite stories of customers that I heard was a salesperson was talking to a mechanic and he was talking about what sort of email he would like to have and what kind of hosting, whether he wants cloud or cPanel hosting. And the mechanic just said, look, I don't care, build my website, here's my phone number, make my phone ring and send me the bill. And that was the last we heard of him. He didn't provide us content. He didn't provide us any details about his business. We had his contact details. We wrote all the content and we just got his phone ringing and sent him the bell. Net Registry, where happy mechanics go to grow their business online. Visit netregistry.com.au or give them a buzz on 1300 638 734 and tell them Timbo sent you. So, Jay, let's talk about finding the time and how we handle these complaints. Because one thing that comes to mind when I look at a book like Hug Your Haters is that for the big businesses, the, 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 the medium to large enterprises out there, this is a book that every single one of them have got to read. But for your vet or your plumber or your hardware st- store owner, mind you, there's no more hardware store, so I don't know why I thought about that, but <laughs> these guys aren't getting complaints levelled at them online every day. So what do you say to those guys? I think it's a couple of things. One, it is it is understanding um, that even if you don't get a lot of online complaints, that's that's not um, the, the, the only thing we talk about in the book. Right. It's that complaints in general, um, let me say it this way, haters, negative customers are your most important customers, hmm. period. And it doesn't matter whether they complain online, offline, skywriting, direct mail, doesn't matter. Uh, they are your most important customers. Because I want to tell you something. I want to tell you what is the most overrated thing in life. The most overrated thing in life is praise. 
yeah. praise. <laughs> because every time a customer says, oh, thanks so much, you're so great at X, you already know that. Praise never teaches you anything anything you didn't already know. What teaches you something, what makes you a better business owner is criticism because that uncovers areas where you can do better. So I'm going to tell you a story. There's a a business uh, called La Pan Quotidienne and they're a chain of bakeries uh, and kind of cafes. There's 220 locations. They're a good-sized business. They're based in Belgium. They have some locations in in the U.S., many throughout continental Europe. I don't think they have any in Australia. So they got a new uh, director of customer experience, a lady in charge of all these kind of issues. And her goal, her goal was to triple the number of complaints, Hmm. right? Not to minimize the number Mm -hmm. of complaints, which is what you would expect, Mm -hmm. to triple the number of complaints. Why? Because every complaint is free market research. It teaches you what you can do better. And that is even more true for small businesses because every unhappy customer who you actually know is unhappy represents a whole bunch of other customers who never said anything. The research in the book says that 95% of unhappy customers never complain in a form or fashion that you will find. Ouch. Never complain. 95%. So if you, you, and this is what happens all the time with small businesses, they dismiss the unhappy customer as an exception. That person's unhappy, that's a bad customer, she's crazy, whatever. But mathematically, that one unhappy, crazy customer probably represents a bunch of other customers that had the same problem but never took the time to tell you about it. Can, can we explore that bakery example? That's fascinating. So what that lady has done is that she has made it – what am I asking? Did she go ahead and make it easier for customers to complain? She didn't She didn't say, hey, guys, make um, make really bad bread so that more people complain. What she basically said was <laughs> <laughs> let's, they're already out there. They're just not complaining, so let's give them the opportunity to complain. Well, or or they are complaining, but we're not taking the time to, to either – find it or listen to it or learn from it. So you know how, you know what's the, let me give you a little advice. The very best way, the very best way to get fewer complaints, stop listening for them. Very, it's a bit cryptic just for stop a young listening. bloke like me. Stop listening. Just stop listening. Yeah, okay. just stop listening. Just just don't ask for feedback. Just don't look hard enough. Don't gotcha. look at social media to see if anybody's mentioned you. Don't check your email as frequently. Mm-hmm. Don't return voice messages. I mean, if you want to minimize mm. complaints, all you got to do is turn a blind eye and <laughs> yeah. you're like, well, we didn't yeah. have any complaints. Yeah. Tell it to the hand because the face ain't listening. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And what she's doing, uh, what what uh, Aaron Pepper is her name, what she's doing at LPQ is the exact opposite. It's let's do everything we can to, if somebody has a problem with us, make sure they tell it to us in a way that we can find it, right? All kinds of cards and table tents and surveys and emails and follow up to say, please, 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 please let us know Brilliant. anything we did wrong because that's how we're going to get better. And obviously then all those complaints come into the bakery. Um, she, what, what does she do with them or what do they do with them then? It's an interesting setup because they've got all these different locations, all of which have a store manager. She does not have each store manager participate because it could get a little loud mm. uh, and a little disorganized. So she handles it all. And then every time she interacts with a customer uh, that is store specific, then she sends it to the manager. They get a report every morning that says, here's what was said about your particular location today. Uh, and I'll give you an example of how that works uh, in practice. And so they were getting uh, a series of complaints uh, in a bunch of different places, email, phone, social media, uh, restaurant review websites, all that, a bunch of complaints about their lemonade. And so she saw this and identified it as a pattern. She thought, you know, that's really unusual because typically people say our lemonade is great. And now everybody is saying our lemonade is not great. Um, That's weird. And so she took those complaints sent them to the store manager, but then she realized um, that that these complaints were fairly consolidated geographically. They're all from a similar region. And so then she talked to the regional manager and found out after some investigation that the um, chefs, the, the you know store chefs in those locations were using an old recipe. Something had gotten messed up and they were using like the three years ago lemonade recipe uh, and it had you know sort of surfaced in all these complaints. Mm -hmm. And if you weren't paying attention and you weren't sort of 
you know, embracing that kind of culture of negativity, that culture of customer feedback, you never would have known. You get these complaints, Jay, and every business gets them. Do you res- you respond to them all? That's clearly a learning. You don't ignore them and you respond to them. Do you necessarily have to action everything that the complainant says? You should always respond. Um, you should always apologize even if you don't mean it. Um, and you should always understand that, especially online, customer service is a spectator sport, right? It, it, <laughs> you know, there's all these other people who are watching. And yes, you want to make that customer happy, even if you think that customer is wrong. And I'm not saying the customer is always right. I'm just saying the customer should always be heard. Yes, you want to try and make the customer happy, but it is infinitely more important online to make sure that you demonstrate your values for all the other people that are watching, who are looking on Twitter or Facebook. Mm-hmm. Book or all these different websites or or you know discussion boards or forums, those are the people who are looking on to see how you handle it. That's really who you're talking to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Being heard is, I imagine, a large part of addressing a complaint. Oh, we, of course. We, we, we hear you. We hear you. We, we, you know, uh, we can't necessarily make that change. In fact, I um. I didn't complain, but I, I use Zero, the online um, bookkeeping system, Zero, and I wanted to make some changes to it. Um, sent them a, a, a request only this week. They've come back and said, "This is how you make the changes to the templates you want to make changes to." There's two things you can't make changes to. We've added those things to our list of uh, nice to dos, and we'll see where the votes go. Basically, is what they said. It's kind of nice. Yes. I felt heard. Absolutely. Didn't get all my problems yes. resolved, but I felt heard and they're onto it. I'm I'm on a list. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I mean, at least you're on the list, right? And and what happens now is that in many cases, if companies can't if they know like look, we can't we can't actually fix that mm. instead of hearing you, they just ignore it. They never they never even yeah. get back to yeah. you. Not good. So it takes a bad situation and it makes it worse, which is crazy to me. But crazy. but you know, people People don't spend enough time and enough resources on customer service in general. In fact, uh, here's a, a, a bit of statistics around that. Each year, worldwide, business spends about $500 billion on marketing and about $9 billion on customer service. Now, this is despite the fact that you learn in the first day in business, the first day, you learn that it makes more financial sense to keep the customers you've already earned than it does to have to replace those customers over and over and over and over again. Like, there's no debate about that. Everybody knows that to be true, yet we don't actually spend our time according to that principle or our money. Just want to explore that bakery example. Just one one last bit of it for, for small businesses listening, who are thinking, "Oh, that's good. I should I should try and extract more complaints from my customers." Is, it's all about the question. Is the right question, Jay? What could we be doing better, or what are we doing wrong? Or is there another? Is there a better question? On, on which part? I'm sorry. Um, as a as a question to ask, as a business owner, going out to your customers and extracting complaints, right? Actively getting mm-hmm. more complaints. Yeah. Is yeah. the right question to ask? Uh, what could we be doing better, or what are we doing wrong? I, I would. I would ask it as what could we do, what what could we be doing better um, is probably how I would go about that. I think you're going to get a more balanced set of of responses that way. Yeah. Um, You know, you don't want to, you don't want to give it a negative characteristic um, when you put it out there, but the, the, you know, the right approach is to is to do it not just one way. And a lot of companies say, well, we have a survey that we send to customers. Like, well, great. I'm glad you do. And that's better than not having a survey. But there's a bunch of other touch points that you have with your customers where you could be asking for feedback. And I think a lot of companies say, well, we've got the survey. And they just sort of, you know, wash their hands and say, okay, we're done. Um, and and that's, that's not enough. There's lots of other places that you could be um, requesting feedback either overtly or, or at least um, you know, you know, somewhat just nudging customers to, to, to speak up. Totally. Now, let's talk uh, about extreme complaints. Have you got an example where a business has received some hate from the haters and where they've gone out and given them those haters a big hug and turned it around in their favour? 
Absolutely. Uh, and you see it quite a bit. If you if you, if you look for it, you'll see it. Uh, also, obviously most of the examples we have are online because those are the ones mm-hmm. that you can actually find, you know, the, the circumstances where that happens on email or phone happen every day. Uh, you just don't, you just don't see it, um, as much or you can't document it in the same way. Uh, one of the ones that, um, uh, that, that I'm really familiar with and I just like the way she handles it is, uh, there's a business owner in California in the state. She owns some uh, pizza restaurants and, and when people provide uh, negative feedback for her stores, she answers them back uh, every time. Uh, and these would be on websites like Yelp or TripAdvisor or Urban Spoon, which is a restaurant review uh, mm-hmm. website. And and she says, really sorry we disappointed you. We'll make sure that the store manager knows and we're going to work to improve. And by the way, could we send you a, a gift card uh, for a free meal so that you'll give us another chance? Nice. And it has this huge impact on people because they're like, wow, not only did you listen, not only did you respond, not only did you apologize, but you're willing to you're willing to actually, you know, bring me back to the store. Uh, and and does that cost her a little bit of money and gift cards and free pizza? Of course. But what she tells me is that that's the very best marketing she does. Customer service is the new marketing. And so she's like, look, it, it costs us you know $20 a week uh, in free pizza to show everybody online what kind of company we are. She's like, it's, it's a complete investment in our reputation. <laughs> does she just not have a whole lot of people now going, hey, listen, guys, if you go over to that pizza shop and complain, you'll get a free voucher. <laughs> That's exactly what I. That's exactly what I asked her because that's the natural reaction, right? Like, well, I'm just going to make a fake negative review. Yeah, but they actually keep a list, right? So they right. keep a whole list uh, of of who they've given them to. So she can't. She doesn't give out two to the same person. Um, and and she says, yeah, is it true that maybe somebody came up with a fake review to get a a voucher? Maybe, but again, because it's a spectator sport, it's more about all the other people who see that interaction. Like, wow, these guys really care. That's that's what what pays off. So, uh, I think that's a really really smart way of handling your yeah, business. True, Jay. Are there times when you shouldn't hug your haters? You should always respond. Always. Now, I give you two examples and exceptions. One. There are some customers that are crazy, right? There are trolls. They are, they are just, they're just angry people. Yeah. Uh, you should always still answer them, especially online, because again, it's a spectator sport. You want to demonstrate that you don't pick and choose, that you treat every customer the same, uh, even when they're outlandish and crazy. Um, you should always respond, but. You should always also follow Jay Bear's rule of reply only twice. And my rule of reply only twice is very, very useful for small businesses. And it's this. You never, ever, 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 ever reply to a customer more than twice online because you can get sucked into a vortex of negativity very easily. Mm. Somebody says, we hate you. You say, we're sorry. They say, no, we really hate you. You say, hey, we are really sorry. We should talk about this in greater depth, maybe email, maybe phone call. Here's my phone number. Here's my email. And then they come back a third time and say, no, we really hate you. You just walk away. Mm. My advice is you don't have to answer a customer every single time. You only have to answer them twice. After that, go away because you can't turn everybody from a detractor to an advocate and you do not ever want to get into a negative tit for tat with a customer because eventually you're going to say something that you didn't mean to say and it's going to completely ruin all this spectator stuff that you're trying to work on and it's hard especially for small businesses because when somebody complains about your small business they're essentially saying that your baby is ugly and and that is that is hard and Mm. in fact we interviewed a bunch of psychiatrists for the book and talked about the brain chemistry and how you're actual brain changes when you get negativity from a customer. It's really hard. You got to kind of keep yourself calm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and, and detached and kind of see it for what it is and not overreact. Yes. It's not, it's not personal, right? It, it feels personal to you in many mm. cases, but it's not personal. Mm. Yeah. For some business owners, this stuff would be really easy. It's, it's, it's marketing manner, whereas for others, this, this, the whole concept of hug your haters, um, as much as you have made it beautifully simple and it just makes sense in your book, uh, they're going to really struggle with it. But it doesn't make it wrong. It just means they've got to work harder at bringing it to market. Yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, that's, that's why I wrote the book, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, yeah. A little bit hard to, it's a little bit hard to write a book about customer service because everybody thinks they're good at it. But, but so many people who have seen me speak about it or have seen little previews of the book are like, oh, I 
thought I was really good at customer service and then I read your book and I realized that I'm not. It's really interesting. You're right about that whole customer service thing. It's like um, I think you mentioned a stat, um, a video I was watching of you. You said like there's 95 – correct me if I'm wrong here, but 95% of businesses believe they offer great customer service. 5% of the customers of those businesses believe they got great customer service. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's eighty percent, eighty percent, right? Eighty percent say they deliver great customer service, and eight percent of their customers agree, oh. uh, which is exactly right. You're like, okay, how can that be true? How can almost every business think they're good at customer service, and almost no customers think that's so? Uh, and we tend to fool ourselves in, in, in how we handle customers because it's it's human nature, right? We we see the good examples uh, and we remember those, and we tend to ignore the bad examples. Yeah, do, you know, what, what, one of the wonderful things about Hug Your Haters, Jay, is that, you know, that whole thing around unique selling proposition or what's your point of difference, it's really hard. In in, in a world of parity where there are so many businesses are the same, and I hear so many business owners say, well, our our, our point of difference is that we offer amazing customer service. Well, that's, you know, let's say that's crap. But if you dig deeper, what do you mean by that? And they can now say, having read your book, well, actually what we do is we extract as many complaints as we can from our customers and we attend to them. That's a point yes. of difference. Yes, of course it is. Mm. Yeah, and if I say, uh, hey, name me a company that's really good at online customer service, you could probably name a couple, and that's because they're so rare. Mm. If I say, who's really good at customer service, you shouldn't be able to tell me because everybody should be good at it. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It should right? be invisible totally. Who, you should who, be like, who, I don't have an answer for that. Who do you put out there? Zappos have always been the leaders. Uh, sure, yeah, they're really good. Still up there? Yeah, they're really good. Uh, and and they, they believe in it culturally, right, which is the way to do it. Yeah. Uh, one of the examples, probably my favorite example in the book uh, is KLM, which mm. is the uh, the airlines for the Netherlands. Uh, they're amazing uh, they they have uh, they answer like sixty thousand social media questions a week uh, in fourteen different languages twenty four hours a day. Last oh, year they right. sold twenty five million dollars worth of airline tickets accidentally uh, as a customer service group because they're just <laughs> that helpful. Um, so there's a there's a ton of of companies that are really really good at it. Some of them get get talked about um, like Zappos and and others don't, but they're mm. just really good. Yeah, yeah. Well, Zappos wrote he wrote the book on uh, what was it called? Um, uh, selling happiness and kind of putting yeah, delivering happiness. Delivering yep. happiness. Hey, yep. uh, love hug your haters. I will put a link in the Thank show you. notes to to the book, guys, as well as Jay's previous two books in utility and the now revolution. Jay, before I let you go, um, podcasting, mate. We're both podcasters. This is a conversation really for my benefit, no one else's. Uh, what's your view on where podcasting is going? Uh, if you look at the research, the um, number of people that are listening to at least one podcast per month uh, is skyrocketing. Uh, I think that is terrific. Oh, uh, yeah. I think it's absolutely on the rise. Uh, I feel like the technology of podcasting is going to have to be easier yeah. for it to make the next jump. I mean, it's still a little nerdy, right? It's still a little geeky. Oh, the yeah. whole download iTunes or Stitcher or whatever. It's just, you know, like like we do it all the time and our listeners do it and thank God they do. But but I think, you know, is my mom going to listen to a podcast? I'm like, no. Uh, it's not because she's not interested in the content. It's just the, the, the apps and the this and the that. It's just, you know, it's, it's not for everybody yet. So I think the technology needs to get more seamless. And I think part of it is 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 the ability to play podcasts through other devices, right? So whether it's uh, maybe it's um uh you know through Netflix or or sort oh, yeah. of other 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 ways that um you know that the content can be accessed and, and having a podcast layer on that. I know Spotify is experiencing is experimenting now with uh, with podcasts mm. in their system, which is nothing but good news. So uh, I also feel like um we're gonna start to see a lot more video podcasts as well um with, with technologies like Blab and things like that. The ability to kind of make more of a talk show format. I think you're gonna yeah, see a lot more of that. Yeah great. I, I mean I I love the audio format because it, you can consume it anywhere. I mean, I think with video, you've mm-hmm. got to you've got to be leaning into the screen um, in order to, to listen to that. But in, you're right. I mean, I still think the biggest blockage is the technology, and it is geeky. And you know, I, I, I use Downcast as the app that I use mm-hmm. to listen to all my podcasts. Yep. I still find it a little bit, you know, like trying to put a playlist together. 
I still struggle. You know, if I'm going on a long drive and want to line up 10 podcasts to listen to that play one after the other and create a playlist, it's still hard. So what do you think, any idea what that, te- it must be, you'd go and invent it if you knew, what's the technological shift that needs to happen? It, it almost needs to be like a radio, doesn't it, where you just kind of that's right. skim that's through right. the, the frequency yep. and... Mm. Yes, I think that's exactly it. And, and also... Uh, you know, podcast is 100% pull, right? So, yeah. so you, you kind of try and figure out what you want to listen to and then you find it and then you subscribe. It's like an email newsletter, right? Where it almost needs to be more like push. So you turn into the business channel uh, and you just get podcasts, right? And you get one after another and things like that. So it's, it's less of a subscription. Uh, you know, you don't subscribe to TV channels other than on your uh dvr um so so i think there's, there's got to be more of that more more like radio actually yeah. uh and and less like email and i also feel like and this is probably um uh too specific but i also feel like the name podcast doesn't yeah, really yeah, help yeah, it. Yeah. Right? it doesn't it, you know yeah i mean in and of itself <laughs> you're like well wait a second like why can't this be internet radio <laughs> right i mean that I just, just makes a lot of sense. Audio, audio on demand i don't i used to yeah, say radio yeah, yeah, on demand but but even that yeah. it's not radio necessarily i mean my show your show is like a radio show but there are other podcasts that aren't like radio shows and i think so it's like audio on demand and you know yes. i won't go on how much i love it but um what do you um what are you listening to besides the small business big marketing show which i'm sure you tune into every tuesday Jay, the Small Business Big Jay. Marketing Show is the number one business podcast for all of Australia. And as one of my favorite countries in the world, did a whole tour out there last summer. Uh, small Business Big Marketing, I could not recommend it highly enough. And obviously people who are listening now already know that. Um, I listen to uh, Marcus Sheridan's uh, mm-hmm. uh, podcast, uh, Mad Marketing. That's a great one. Uh, I listen to Mitch Joel's uh, show, Six Pixels. This has been around for a really long, a long time. time. Uh, you know, mostly marketing shows. We talked about Joe Palizzi. I listen to his show all the time. Do you uh, listen to any, um, any non – I find myself uh, – you know, I've got a lot of marketing podcasts on my on yeah. my uh, phone. But what else are you listening to? One of my favorites. I'll, let's go one for one. I'm listening to Alec Baldwin's Here's the Thing. Uh, you know, I haven't heard that show, but I'm told it's amazing. Oh my god, so good! Yeah, yeah. I'm, I mean, he's he's just such a pro. I mean, that guy is amazing. Yeah, yeah. You know what show I really like? And it's a little bit hit and miss on an episode to episode basis. But um, there's a show uh, by Slate, uh, the Slate.com mm-hmm. guys, called Working that they've been doing for a few years now. And uh, what they do is they interview uh, somebody who has a particular job and they say, okay, what is your job really like? Like, <laughs> what do you actually do all day and how does it, so they've, you know, they've had waiters and they've had uh, artists and, and realtors and, you know, then like weird jobs, you know, like, um, yeah. uh, you know, an, animal therapists and, and uh, uh, you know, one guy was like a, uh, some sort of weird, like, you know, m- like sadomasochist bondage <laughs> guy. It's like, what's your job like? I'm like, wait a second. So it's really fascinating because people say like, my job is really weird. And I guess it is. But you listen to a show like that. You know, you know what? Everybody's job is weird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, what a great show. That's what I love about podcasting. There's always, there's no topic that's probably not covered if you look hard enough. Um, I don't want to let you go. So I'm going to ask you one more question veering away from podcasting. Leave your crystal ball out, Jay. But wh- where do you th- where Where's the next big space we should be looking at in in the world of marketing? The next big space um, that people should be looking at in the world of marketing. I I, I really believe um, that that it is video. Um, really, that that everybody wants to watch and not read. And I say that because I've got two teenagers at home and I watch how they behave, mm-hmm. right? And my kids do not read, but they watch constantly. They constantly are consuming video and not just on YouTube. I mean, they're watching video on Snapchat and Instagram and Twitter and all these other places. And, and so we are advising most of our corporate clients to get really good at video-based content right now. Hmm. Interesting. Didn't expect that. Did not expect that, but I get it. Uh, I've got three teenagers and they consume a lot of video. Uh, they don't consume any podcasts. Breaks my heart. <laughs> but, no, um... I have same. Same. <laughs> exactly the same. They don't. Goodness me, hey, video. Well, well I mean, because for kids, for kids that age, even the shortest podcast is too long for oh, them. Oh, yeah. Attention span of a gnat. Yeah, I used to do a, I used to do a daily video show called Jay Today, three minutes every day, a three minute video, mm. and it was really successful, and it was the best, probably the most successful thing I've ever done. Uh, and I stopped doing it because I got into the the you know the 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 real hard work of doing this book, and I couldn't do both yeah. for now. But uh, you know, people like that little quick hit every day. You know, it's like 
It's like that slot machine of attention. What was your workflow on that? Because one of the things with video is that there is a lot of sort of there's there's blockages all along the way, you know, setting up the camera, um, hitting record, uh, preparing for all that, getting the edit done. What was, was, was there a simple workflow that you had? Yeah. Absolutely. We we really refined it partially because we just sort of run and gunned it like we didn't plan it out. So because it's a daily show, um, we would just record it on my iPhone. Um, I had a, had a handheld tripod on my iPhone. I'd come up with something I want to talk about that day, turn on the phone, talk into it for three minutes, turn the phone off. So no script, no storyboard, no prep. Uh, not everybody can do that, mm. uh, but but I can. So I just turn on the phone, talk into it, turn it off, upload it to some post-production uh, friends of mine uh, called Candidio. They took it, uh, very light editing, added an opening title sequence, an ending title sequence, uploaded it to Dropbox, and then my editorial assistant would take it, put it on YouTube, put it on my blog, put it on iTunes, put it on iTunes as a video podcast as well. Then we would take it and transcribe it each episode, turn it into a blog post, a blog post on LinkedIn, a blog post on Medium. Uh, Every single three-minute episode became nine pieces of content, which is a very efficient way to go. Brilliant. Love a bit of repurposing. Jay, yes, I love talking to you, mate, and I, 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 I'm going to take you up on the offer that you asked, you shared before we hit record, which is, you know, maybe we could do a two, three-part series. So, you know, careful there. I'll call you. Anytime. <laughs> I would love to do it again, and uh, I think I'm coming down that way again this year, so I'll make oh, sure cool. uh, we get together. We'll do, a, we'll do a face-to-face show. Yeah, please do. And how do people find you? Uh, jbear.com uh, is uh, my personal site. Hugyourhaters.com is for the book uh, and our main site with all kinds of education and resources for marketers, including the six now, six weekly podcasts that we produce, uh, convinceandconvert.com. Love it, mate. Uh, you are an absolute marketing machine. Jay, thanks for sharing your marketing wisdom on the Small Business Big Marketing Show. Timbo, my pleasure. Great to be here. Oh, yeah. There you go. Jay Bear. Of Hug Your Haters. Go and buy that book. I'll put a link in the show notes to 200 and episode 296 where you can grab it. And do hit him up on Twitter. Let him know you heard him on the Small Business Big Marketing Show. He'd like that. I'd love that. Now, I want to th- share my top three attention grabbers with you. Thanks to the very good folks at Key Person of Influence. they got their one-day brand accelerator program coming up. Not to be missed. Grab a seat. They're not expensive, I tell you. Over at keypersonofinfluence.com forward slash Timbo and netregistry.com.au forward slash Timbo. They've got three exclusive packages to help you get your business found online because you know what? You are who Google says you are. Righto. Attention grabber number one. Adopt the hug your haters mindset. Embrace your haters for all they're worth. Hey? I'm sure there are many business owners out there, some listening, who would run a mile from a complaint. Now you know that that is the wrong thing to do, and you've got to hug them. Give them some love. They need it. Attention grabber number two, actively encourage feedback and make it easy for people to provide it to you. Love that example of the bakery lady. Hey, What a wonderful business idea to actually encourage people to give you feedback, to constructively complain, and then you can grow from knowing how people think. Attention grabber number three, take the complaint offline after two responses from the hater. Otherwise, you know, you can see it becoming a bit of a mud slinging match, can't you? That's a good idea too. And they'll probably appreciate the personal touch in doing that. They're my three attention grabbers, thanks to Key Person of Influence and Net Registry. What was yours? I would love to know. What did you learn from that episode? What are you going to implement in your business? Head over to smallbusinessbigmarketing.com. Look out for episode 296. You can leave a comment there and links to all the resources that were mentioned in that interview. Neil Fior once said, There's a myth that time is money. In fact, time is more precious than money. It's a non-renewable resource. Once you spend it, and if you've spent it badly, it's gone forever. Righto, team. How are we going for time? You right? I think there's a bit more marketing value to be shared, so stick with me. I've got this great bit of feedback and idea for an upcoming episode 
from a listener, Tony Rogers. He says, hey, Tim, mega podcast, exclamation mark. Thanks, Tony. Always interesting to hear the stories from other business owners on how they use disruptive and helpful marketing to grow. Isn't it? Isn't it, Tone? Unbelievable what people share. That's why I love doing this show. Timbo, I've been, yes, Tone, I've been listening since early 2014. Thanks, buddy. And I've not heard, oh, here we go. I've not heard the power of good photography conversation. Yeah, fair point. Besides a little in the Frank Body Scrub episode, yeah, we did cover that. That was more an episode about sex cells, which it does. Go back and listen to that one. Those girls are doing amazing things. Be careful of their Instagram page, though. It's a little bit naughty. As a Back to Tone. As a creative photographer, many of my commissions are from small business owners wanting new imagery to enhance their marketing materials. Yeah, very important be it new headshots, product shots, or or photographs to tell their business story. I'm sure many businesses would find this topic helpful. I absolutely agree. Uh, In fact, I have got someone in mind, Tony, who has not only got some great things to say about the power of great photography in your marketing, he's actually got a really, really inspiring business story. Uh, So I'll tap him on the shoulder. I know he'll say yes, and we'll sort that one out. Back to Tony says, keep it going. I appreciate and value your time twice a week on my drive to the office. Oh, Tone, I've let you down, mate. I've backed it off to once a week. We'll get back to twice a week at some point, but I hope you're enjoying once a week anyway. Thanks, he says, Tony Rogers, website, greytoblackphotography.com. And he's from, how's this for a place? Sounds like something out of a fairy tale. Royal Tunbridge Wells in the United Kingdom. I imagine that having like flowing streams and castles and moats and little bridges with kind of princess princesses and princes sitting there. I don't know. Hmm, nice place. Love your work, Tone. Thanks for your feedback. Most appreciated. <laughs> Hey, speaking of just wonderful feedback and a podcast that you should listen to, I got some feedback on iTunes from a fellow podcaster, and he's also a forum member. His name is Luke Holt, and he says this in iTunes about this show. Natural, inspiring, intelligent, five stars. Thanks, Luke. I'm chuffed, buddy. So many podcasts are fake and overconstructed. Tim Reed is natural and real and shows a clear passion and intelligence to help small business owners crank their marketing. Yeah, good on you, Lukey. That's what I do, buddy. I listen to the show. I'm a member of the Small Business Big Marketing Forum, and it has helped me in my first year of business. Thanks, Timbo and team, for making yourself available in a way that I could never afford if you charged consulting fees to me. Good on you, Lukey. Thank you for that. Hey, listeners, i got to tell you, Luke and his wife, Susie, have got a wonderful podcast. Go over to lukeandsusie.com. I actually got interviewed on episode 36. I'll put a link in the show notes for this episode. You can find it. Um, They ask great questions. It's a real heartfelt podcast. That's how I would describe it. So, uh, hey, uh, you want to get a mention on the show? Yeah, you. You're the one listening. Simply leave a listener review over on iTunes or Stitcher along with your most pressing marketing conundrum and I'll answer it in an upcoming episode. There's no downside there. You get your brand in front of thousands of motivated business owners globally and I, yeah me, I get a bit of loving. (laughs) All righty. I think that is about it for episode 296 of the Small Business Big Marketing Show. But don't fear, don't fret. Plenty of marketing gold coming your way in the weeks ahead. Next episode, we joined you and me. We're joined by Scott Matthews, who, check this out, he's an aquatic, was, I should say, an aquatic ecologist, who then became a policeman. <laughs> and now he's an award-winning mortgage broker with a great view on marketing. So that's next week. 
Hey, be sure to use Net Registry if you need a website or you need to get your current website found. They've got exclusive offers over at netregistry.com.au forward slash Timbo. And be sure to grab a seat at an upcoming key person of influence business brand accelerator day. Really good days, I promise. Head over to keypersonofinfluence.com forward slash Timbo. But, and I mean but, only if you want to create an unfair advantage in your business. Hey, thanks, audio legend, Daryl Misson. I know you're listening, mate, for making this show sound svelte. Yeah, svelte. Love that word, not used enough. And thanks to Lockie Dolly for the tunes that you hear throughout this show. Check him out over at LockieDoley.com. I'll spell it for you. L-A-C-H-Y-D-O-L-E-Y.com. If you want to surround yourself with other motivated business owners, head over to the Small Business Big Marketing Forum at crankmymarketing.com. 69 bucks a month, team. 30 day. No questions asked. Money back guarantee. No risk. If you need a speaker for an upcoming event, timreed.com.au. Thanks to the listeners who have gone and booked me for events this year and last year. Hugely appreciate it. Love meeting you guys. In fact, spoke at a listener's event just this week. Drew Grosskreutz over at Otium up in uh, Maroochydore in uh, Queensland. Great event. Hey, until next week, I am Timbo Reid. Thanks for listening to the Small Business Big Marketing Show. May your marketing be the best marketing. Bye for now. 